Can you all hear me? Is the mic live and we're all set? Okay, can we, uh, let's just get right to the slides. So the title of my book and also of this lecture is Courtyards, uh, Aesthetic, Social, and Thermal Delight. And this is very important to me, this mixture. I mean, architecture for me is this mix of the aesthetic, of course. You know, that's one of the main reasons why we're in this subject. But also the social and the actual performance of the spaces. What do they do socially? How do they physically function? And courtyards are such a wonderful uh, combination of these three influences. The old firmness, commodity, and delight that Vitruvius talked about centuries ago. So I come from a climate, um, because after leaving Muncie, and that was, by the way, about 60 years ago, so if you ask me how Muncie has changed, I haven't the faintest, because, you know, at age three, you don't have very many memories. But after leaving Muncie, I've mostly lived in, in climates at least as cold. And the uh, slide on your left really illustrates that one of the fundamental differences between the way I was raised, in which winter was always the more severe, of the conditions, and therefore, how one heats, especially your home, uh, is sort of foremost. Whereas in the climates that we're going to be looking at today, especially the hot, arid climates, where I believe that courtyards work the best in terms of the thermal device, in those climates, really the summer is the dominant condition rather than winter. Yeah, it's cold in the winter, especially in Cordoba, but it's much, much more uncomfortable in summer. And so if your building is going to deal with one of the two, it would rather keep you cool in summer than help keep you warm in winter. So that's going to be one of the differences that you'll probably see as, as we go through this today. Okay, next two. So I began my studies in, in Mexico, uh, this tiny little, this is the state of Colima, Mexico. It is the smallest of the states of Mexico. And you'll be able to see that it's due west of the Distrito Federal, uh, due west of Mexico City. And I chose Colima. Uh, to go to in a sabbatical now more than 20 years ago because I was, I, I felt that I understood passive solar heating pretty well, but I just felt like I knew nothing about passive cooling. And I wanted to find a place whose temperatures were the same as Eugene in the summer, but my sabbatical was in the winter. So I went through the Mexican climate data and found that Colima's December and January daily range of temperature and relative humidity is virtually identical to Eugene, Oregon's daily range of both temperature and humidity in July and August. So great, you know, I could go, I, would, I could leave rainy Oregon in December, go down to Mexico and find summer in Eugene. Uh, and sure enough, I did, but of course there would be cultural differences. So anyway, this is, this is uh, the state of Colima on a contour map with a hole poked in the volcano. There are two active volcanoes, uh, one of which erupts quite frequently, and in fact, a couple months ago, they even had to evacuate one of the villages on the slopes of the Volcan de Fuego, as they call it, in Colima. Next two. And what I found then, knowing absolutely nothing, nothing about Colima, except its temperature and humidity range <laughs> in, in December and January, what I found was this lovely old Spanish colonial layout of downtown, uh, then surrounded by the sort of not so lovely newer suburbs where they're starting to build houses the way North American build them instead of the way the Spanish colonial folks build them. So here you are with the, the Volcan de Fuego in the background and then a, a closer up of the downtown. Here's the cathedral, here's the state house, and here's the public square. And other than that, in the older section of the city, trees on the streets, for example, are, are a rare occurrence. The streets are very narrow and very stark. Next two. So here then is an aerial of uh, downtown Colima. Here was uh, my map of it. And let me just point out, first of all, on the left, from an urban planning point of view, the kind of density that you can get when you build courtyard buildings. Typically what happens, now, now, most of these, despite the fact that it's in downtown Colima, most of these were built as residences. And in the traditional Spanish and Spanish colonial neighborhoods, you build to the property line and your outdoor space is the courtyard. In other words, you surround your garden with the house which is completely the opposite of what we do in North America, which is surround the house with the garden. So the only outdoor space that you typically have is a courtyard, but on the other hand, it's completely private. 
as long as you have controls over how high your neighbors can build, you have a totally private outdoor space. It may not be very big, but it's completely yours. Only you look into it. And if you want to turn off all the lights at night and look at the stars, you can because the street lights don't come in and the neighbor lights don't come in. It's actually a wonderful way to get quite a bit of density and still have outdoor privacy. Now, on, uh, on the other slide, what you see around the edge is the typical North American grid of about 300 foot square blocks with 66 foot wide rights of way for the streets, the old surveyor's length of chain. So that's what you see around the edge. And in comparison, these are the street widths of Colima, Mexico. You see that the streets are almost invariably more narrow and it's also kind of an irregular grid. You'll also notice that the whole city is set at 45 degrees off the cardinal points of the compass, which is a very typical thing that the Spanish colonial cities did. Kind of gives you sunrise and sunset in the summertime coming down one set of streets, sun, sunrise and sunset in the winter coming down another. So it was a fairly typical way to do it. Whether that was the reason they did it or not is open to question, but it's fairly typical that the Spanish colonial cities are set at 45 degrees. Okay, next one. So uh, in the center of Colima then, to make up for these very stark streets with hardly any vegetation whatever, uh, the, the central plaza is all loaded with trees, as you can see. And of course, there's the gazebo bandstand right in the middle. And of course, every Saturday night, there's a band concert. And just the, the, the kind of the innovations, for example, this man needed to water the garden in the plaza. Do you see how he did it? Rather than having to have a special valve someplace, he simply jams the hose down the neck of the goose here in the fountain and takes the water off and waters the plaza. You see? Next two. So there's a wonderful kind of inventiveness spirit, you know, that goes on in this place. And, and the, uh, the only arcades along the streets, the only place in, in the entire city where, the, where you can walk down a sheltered sidewalk is, are the, the three of the four sides of the plaza. And, and so here's one of the oldest sides with these wonderful sort of you know, six-part arches uh, that you see here in the distance. Looking, here you're looking from the gazebo bandstand at the portal, and here you're looking along the portal. Next to. And so special events like Christmas and its piñatas, for example, uh, enliven. The, the, the center of town is always sort of the center of these seasonal celebrations. So here's what it normally looks like on a shopping day, and here's what it looks like around Christmas. Next to. And uh, here you can see the piñatas hanging in the, in the uh, arcade. Now another thing. Uh, I, I chose Mexico. You, you might say, well, then, you know, if you were interested in passive cooling, why did you choose Mexico? I mean, you could have gone, you could have looked at other places in the world. Well, first of all, Mexico is very convenient in the United States. Second of all, I was interested in learning Spanish. Uh, and thirdly, I felt that if I could find the right climate in Mexico, that I would probably find a culture that did not already have in, that had not already invested in air conditioning to such a point that they wouldn't care about passive cooling anymore. And sure enough, this was 1981. That's been a while ago. I know some of you probably weren't born in 1981. But when I went down there, sure enough, what I found is this is an ice delivery truck making its rounds on the main plaza. If you had a restaurant on the main plaza, you didn't have a refrigerator. You had an ice box. And so these ice trucks would make their rounds and leave blocks of ice outside people's homes and outside of businesses, and that was the way you kept food refrigerated. So you can imagine if they don't have refrigerators, they don't have air conditioners either. And so I very fortunately then, for me, I went to a, a culture where mechanical air conditioning was almost unheard of. Only the banks and the theaters had them. Nobody else had them. Next to. Oops. Uh, reverse. So here we are once again in the public plaza and one more demonstration of the sort of the, centra the social centrality of this public plaza to the city. And by the way, obviously what I'm referring to is like the courtyard, is the social center of the building. This public plaza was like the social center of the whole city. So when it came time for Mexican Independent Days, uh, they erect these wonderful and elaborate castillos as they're called. And then at night, you know, you turn them 
up and light the fireworks. And people crowd right around. You can stand right underneath this thing and be showered with sparks. If that's where you want to stand, no problem. Next to. All right, so a cheek by jowl, the cathedral and the capital of the state, no separation of church and state here. And inside this capitol building is this lovely courtyard. And in fact, as I say, I went to Colima just blissfully ignorant of everything except their temperature and their relative humidity. And so what I found, I started look, walking the streets of Colima looking for evidences of passive cooling. And you know, I'd walk down this street and, and what I kept seeing were these little arch, the zaguan, which is the tunnel that connects the street to the courtyard. And again and again and again, I would get these beautiful glimpses into these, uh, through the zaguan into the courtyard, and I realized what I'm going to find here that's of interest is courtyards. I mean, I didn't see very much shading. And the reason I didn't is because December to January, yeah, it's the same as Eugene's summer, but that's their winter. I was wearing Birkenstocks and shorts, typical ugly American, dressing the way I would in Eugene. You know, shorts and Birkenstocks. I was walking down the shady side of the street. They were wearing sweaters and walking on the sunny side of the street. 83 degrees to them was cold. To me, it was heaven, right? So there was this huge disconnect in, in weather that I thought was, was warm and they would be interested in passive cooling. They were managing to shiver and breaking out the furs for evening parties. Right. So I didn't see very much passive cooling because they didn't feel like they needed it. Right? What, I, what I found was courtyards. Next to. So here, for example, is a typical street. Look at the, first of all, the width, as you can see, barely wide enough for two cars. That's the first thing. Second of all, the width of the sidewalk, barely wide enough for two people. When you get to a telephone pole, one person goes ahead of the other person, then you can walk side by side and resume your conversation. Here's the typical Spanish colonial building. And what I very quickly learned is that the moment that I saw a building that looked like this, right about there was going to be the most heavenly view through this dark little tunnel to this beautiful courtyard. And sure enough, this is the courtyard inside of that building. Next slide, just on the left. And that's the arcade that opens onto the courtyard in this old Spanish colonial building. An absolutely beautiful a combination of, of indoor space that's outdoor related and truly outdoor space. You'll also see this odd kind of thing. These arch arches, as you notice, are completely, just completely open the house to the courtyard, whereas the moment you turn the corner, you've got this elaborate kind of se <coughs> set of French doors, if you will, or perhaps we should call them Spanish doors, that, that can give you a sort of a choice of the degree to which you relate to the courtyard. And here along this arcade, uh, in this case, the doors are closed. It's sort of a cold morning where they're kind of, uh, you know, having tea with a grandmother, and here it'd be a hotter time of day. Next two. So um, what I had to do then was, uh, I, you know, I, I made notations on hundreds of these courtyards. I mean, you can imagine this many blocks with Spanish colonial buildings. There are courtyards all over the place. And I soon realized I'm going to have to have some way of finding my way back to the courtyards that are of interest. I've, I've got to have something that helps me organize these courtyards. And so I you know, thought to myself, okay, what is it about courtyards that I think is the most, what are the most important variables? That's what I asked myself. And if I could make a simple matrix that talked about the two most important variables, then I would have a way of kind of categorize, categorizing these courtyards and choosing which ones to study further. And I decided that the most obvious thing was how, whether it was a shallow courtyard or a deep courtyard or somewhere in between. That's one variable. The other variable that really, I mean, again and again and again, these are the most beautiful little controlled pieces of landscape. And so the real variable here uh, that, that ended up meaning even more to me than depth was vegetation. Can, can we focus this one over here? Yeah. So there's uh, row A here uh, is a completely barren courtyard, not even any potted plants. And believe it or not, there are some courtyards that have absolutely no plants whatsoever. Uh, in courtyard B, all you have are plants and pots. You may have a thousand, but they're all in pots. In courtyard C, you actually have rooted vines or shrubs. 
So these are things that sink their roots into the subsoil below the courtyard and are pretty much permanent residents of the courtyard. And in D, you go a step further and you actually plant a tree that then begins to spread out and create a canopy and begins to intervene in the relationship between the courtyard and the sky. All right. So here on the left is an example of a uh, type of B courtyard, plants in pots. Uh, just next one on the right. And here's one that, that uh, has gone to vines and shrubs and very rarely, by the way, uh, focus over here, very rarely has a grass floor in the courtyard. Those were quite uncommon. But you can also see then a great big splashy fountain that, as you can imagine, on a hot, dry day, which Colima is in the wintertime and Eugene is in the summer, hot and dry, uh, this sound of splashing water is a wonderful psychological coolant as well as the actual physical cooling of you know, air moving through the, the water. Next two. And just to sort of make, make sure that we all understand the role that plants can play in a courtyard, I suppose by now you've all, all realized that this is the same courtyard. This was an American landscape uh, designer who moved to Uruapan, Mexico, in the neighboring state of Michoacan. Moved to Uruapan and bought this house, and this is what it looked like the day they started putting plants into the courtyard. He gave me this slide when I, when I said ooh and ah about his courtyard enough times. He said, okay, well, let me give you this photograph of what it looked like when I first moved in. And when years later I came and visited this place, this is what it looked like. So the difference, again, that just vegetation can make in an otherwise geometrically identical space uh, is very evident, I think, from these two slides. Next two. And the other thing socially that I noticed was that the courtyard form was way across the scale. This was the richest family in Colima. This was the only house where in my broken Spanish I knocked on the door, started off by saying, I'm sorry I don't speak Spanish good. I realized after a, a week or so that I should be saying, I'm sorry I don't speak Spanish well, and noticed that my reception was slightly cooler. So I went back to saying, I'm sorry I don't speak Spanish good, because the evidence was right there in the first sentence. And he, this was the only house where he uh, had me come back three different times before I was actually admitted, and then the maid shadowed me every step that I took. The maid was standing immediately right beside me to make sure that I didn't take anything. Everyone else was as nice as you can possibly imagine, giving me free reign to take any photo. Can you imagine, uh, can you imagine a Mexican coming up to your door, knocking on the door, total stranger, saying in broken English, I'm sorry I don't speak English good, can I photograph your living room? <laughs> I mean, and and I, I had this wonderful reception again and again and again. And so all the way, courtyard from the absolute richest family in, in Colima to the absolute poorest people. The people who rent rooms around this, this courtyard are the street vendors who sell coconuts or, or tacos or something else on the street. And they have the little push carts that are all sort of in one other corner of this courtyard. You can see that there's a hammock, sort of a public hammock. This is a huge tamarindo tree. Uh, one huge tree spreading over this courtyard, and the floor is this big, rough, sort of uneven stones. And these little rooms are just doors. They're not even windows. There's just a door. And it doesn't shut very tightly, so you can always get fresh air at night. And that's, that's, where, the, that's where you live. You just have a bed and a chest of drawers, and everything else is in the courtyard. Next to, so there's this huge social range that the courtyard serves. Here, for example, was the state health offices. This was one of those very rare patio type A's that had no plants whatsoever. It was the office of the state health office. And you can see that, that, that workers just have a regular workstation in the arcade. Just, just get it out of the rain, you'll be happy. It was sort of the idea. The closest thing they had to a plant was a Christmas tree, because as I told you before, I was down there in December, January. Next two. And then uh, the wonderful sort of variety of courtyards. I mean, both of the buildings that you're looking at here were originally built as houses. This eventually became a medical clinic. So while you're waiting to see your doctor, you're sitting in the arcades around the courtyard. This obviously became a really lovely restaurant. So the, the, the sort of the, the variability and, and the adaptability 
of the courtyard form was another thing that really, really made an impression on me. Next two. So um, about, uh, as, as Alfredo said, I was fortunate enough to get a Graham grant to sort of continue my studies. I mean, my courtyard studies were essentially once every seven years. Every time I had a sabbatical, I'd go off and do something about courtyards and do very little in between. So this courtyard book may have been started, you know, more than 20 years ago, but there were huge stretches of time where I did absolutely no work at all on, on that book. So I went back 14 years later with help from the Graham people and, and revisited Colima and, and, uh, to see what I would find. Well, when I first went there, this is the hotel, not quite an L, Hotel ca Casino, all right? This was, this was on the main square, one of the, the main, um, and, and this is the arcade in front of it, and once again, there's the state house. Next to you. And the, uh, the patio of this hotel was completely ringed with bougainvillea, gorgeous bougainvillea vines on these kind of stone arches downstairs, and then there was this open colonnade upstairs. So there were hotel rooms both downstairs and upstairs, but downstairs you had the heavy arches and bougainvillea, and upstairs you sort of had an open colonnade. Next to him. Fourteen years later, I found that the lovely fountain in the middle and all of the bougainvillea had been stripped out of the courtyard, and a couple of plants in pots and maybe a shrub or two had replaced it, I found that the open colonnade on the second floor had been replaced by a punched wall. And I thought, you know, what is going on here? Well, the University of Colima bought the hotel and decided to turn it into a regional museum, all right? Now, why you would need to strip the bougainvillea out of the courtyard is beyond me, but they decided that they did. And of course, you know, architecturally, I, I think a lot of us would say that the building, that the courtyard has improved architecturally, you know, instead of this sort of dual language, almost wedding cake approach of sort of one kind of layer on the bottom and an almost unrelated layer on the top, you've gone with a much more unified kind of, you know, ochre yellow kind of field with these punched openings over each arch. But the spirit of the courtyard was so tied in with both the, the fountain and the bougainvillea, and to have stripped that out, it's, it's like, you know, ripping the spirit out of this building. Next to up on the upper, upper level, that's what you saw, you know, 14 years ago with the bougainvillea and the backlit uh, elephant ear plant, and this is what you see now. And so again, you know, it's this illustration that the courtyard is more than a light well. It does more than just allow you to daylight the rooms around the courtyard. It's, it can, potentially, be an absolutely lovely place where you celebrate the change of seasons and all kinds of other things. But it takes plants to help you do that. Next two. Uh, so here was a, then another example. Remember that the, 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 the richest man where the maid followed me around, shattered my every move? Well, this is what that house looked like uh, at the time when the uh, owner was suspicious of my intentions. Fourteen years later, I found workers all over the place. Incidentally, notice the change in vehicles in 14 years. None, no change in vehicles in 14 years. Next two. So again, the University of Colima having, um, I, I should say, just politically, since, this, since social is part of the title of this lecture, when I first went to Colima, Miguel de la Madrid had just been elected president of Mexico, and Miguel de la Madrid was, an, was a lawyer from Colima. And in the old patronage system, that meant for the next six years, federal money would pour like a waterfall into Colima. And sure enough, the, the university, when I went, to, the, went to, to Colima now 20 years ago, the university was a couple of sort of, you know, low, single story buildings. Now it's a huge institution with all kinds of money, as evidenced by the fact that they could buy the home of the richest man in town and turn it into an art museum. So, you know, they turn one into a regional museum, they turn another into an art museum. So here they are. Here's what I found when it was the rich man's home, complete with papyrus in a pool. And here's what it was becoming when I went there uh, 14 years later. Next to uh, So what was an open courtyard with its own sort of microclimate, celebrating an openness to the sky, was becoming a covered lecture hall. Next to this was one of the best restaurants in Colima uh, uh, 14 years prior. 
uh, Leonardo's had this funny sort of very unusual corner entrance. And then you went on into the patio and, and there was this huge magnolia tree that gave, you know, shade to the patio and made nice places to eat. Fourteen years later, next to it had become the headquarters of an educational lobbying organization. They had cut down the tree, right, removed the tree, and then built some ugly little sort of lean-tos so that they could have a little more covered space, which brings up the issue of how do courtyard buildings expand? And the answer too often is uh, buildings expand to fill the space available, and if the only space available is the courtyard, the courtyards get smaller and smaller as the building covered space gets bigger and bigger. Not a wonderful change. Next to, when I went back this last time, I found that it had undergone yet another transformation, and now it's the tourist office. And now they've got grass in the courtyard and are starting some more vegetation. So you can see the same courtyard building going through some pretty dramatic changes in the space of about a generation. Next to, all right, so after doing this work in Mexico and you know thinking about it a while, I realized that, okay, you, John, you have to go to Spain because uh, clearly this Spanish colonial stuff came from somewhere and you ought to see what they did in Spain that, that sort of uh, inspired all this. And of course, the next thing I should do is learn Arabic and go across and really visit the Islamic countries where so much of this started. Unfortunately, as a male, um, and especially one who doesn't speak either French or Arabic, my chances of getting into Islamic courtyards are about this big because that's the province of women and you know um, contact between the women in the family and non-related males uh, just doesn't happen. So my chances of doing significant courtyard research across the Mediterranean I think are, are pretty slim. So I decided to really concentrate on Spain, uh, Andalusia region of Spain because the Moors ruled there for so many centuries there's, there are courtyards just everywhere. Now that was the building form that they brought with them. And when I asked people who were knowledgeable about Andalusia whether there were some cities that were more promising than the others, the almost unanimous answer was Cordoba. Cordoba is the place where the courtyards are really, really celebrated. So here's the Cordoba end right there of this huge Guadalquivir Valley. Uh, Cordoba is sort of at this upper end. Next two. So here's Cordoba, here's the, in the, in the 10th century, here was the wall around the city, and then there's some more uh, unprotected city over here. One of the old gates, uh, that, that's actually that gate uh, into Cordoba next to you. And the wonderful mosque, that gorgeous, glorious mosque in Cordoba with the thousands of these double arches with the red and white stripes that makes the most magnificent interior. And here's that mosque, uh, focus over here. Here's that mosque uh, seen from across the road. This is the old Roman bridge, and then, and then this is the top of the mosque uh, that has this wonderful interior. Next to. So here's a typical narrow street in Andalusia, and you know, as you walk by here and you look through a door like that, this is what you're likely to see. Once again, the streets are very, very plain. Sort of the Arabic attitude was, don't show the riches on the outside of the house. Concentrate the richness on the interior courtyard. So the exteriors tend to be very plain, not at all ostentatious, but the courtyards, by contrast, are just magnificent. And again, you can see the, the value in all this. I mean, putting it bluntly, the uglier the street is, the more beautiful any courtyard is going to seem. And that seems really to be the attitude in these old courtyard cities. You just don't, you sweep off your sidewalk, but you just don't do much else to the outside of your house. And the, the plainer and the more stark the street is, the more glorious the courtyard, by contrast. Next two. So one of the questions that comes up is, okay, this is all very nice, and the, these are lovely neighborhoods and all that, but what do you do with your car? Hmm. What do you do with your car? Calle Zarco. You realize that's one automobile wide. When a car comes down this street, you quickly walk to the nearest doorway and flatten yourself against the doorway and hope that the rear view mirror doesn't stick out as far as it might. All right? These streets are extremely narrow. And if I walk and, and, and look right into this opening, this is what I see. 
So the courtyard here has been elevated a little bit, up a couple of stairs, and over here is a plunging ramp to a garage underneath the courtyard. And if you try a car that's any longer about, than about 12 feet, it'll hang up on the place where the street meets the ramp because, I mean, it's just got to be teeny tiny cars that can, that can come into a place like this. And even in a teeny tiny car, the opening has to be this wide because the turning radius, you all have fought with turning radiuses at some point when you're laying out a, a design, all of the turning radius has to be taken up inside your property line. You certainly can't, aren't going to get it in the street. So for a one-car garage, you have to have a two-car wide opening. Next to So here's then a plan of that. Here's, here's Kai's Arco, the ramp down to the garage, the stairs up to the patio, and then here's the patio that they built on top of this underground garage. Major problem, no earth contact between the floor of the patio and the, you know, the water table and you can't grow rooted trees and all that kind of thing. That's the big disadvantage. But at least you have a place for the car. Next to So, um, sure enough, why is Cordoba such a wonderful place to study patios? Because every year they have a concurso de patios, a, a patio contest, and the first and second place winners get thousands of dollars. Now that buys lots of geraniums. I mean, really lots of geraniums. And so they take this contest very seriously. Here was the front page of the paper the day after the winner of that year's patio contest was announced. You can see her watering her uh, flowers with a uh, can on a pole. And when you go to the tourist office, they give you this map of Cordoba. And here are all the addresses, the street addresses, of the people who entered the patio contest the year before. So one of the consequences of the patio contest is you better be nice to tourists. And another even more uh, sort of onerous requirement is that you need to keep your patio open from 6 p.m. to midnight uh, two weeks in a row, seven days a week. 6 p.m. to midnight, your patio has to be open if you're going to enter the contest. So, you know, it's a it's pretty demanding event. Next two. So uh, they even have a patio museum. This is the, the uh, Viana Palace Museum, but everybody calls it the patio museum. And if you buy a... Uh, the guide to Cordoba, they'll say, be sure to see the patio museum. So here are, let's see, one, uh, well, th they say that there are 13 patios, but a lot of these are really walled gardens rather than patios. And what, you may ask me, is the difference between a walled garden and a patio? Largely the degree to which the space interacts with, the, the, the more uh, sides of these places that interact with the building directly, the more I call it a courtyard and less a walled garden. So. I'm sorry for the slippery definition, but that's about the best I can do. Next two. And here's uh, one of the uh, courtyards on that little Calle Zarco that I just showed you, the one lane wide street. So standing on the street and looking in, here's the, here's the depth of the Zaguan, and here's the courtyard that you're looking at. Getting up above and looking down, here's this wonderful floor of gray pebbles and black pebbles. Na they're natural colors that have been assembled to make these designs. Next two. And uh, the pets in this particular patio are turtles that live in this little uh, hat ra umbrella rack here. And so you can see, I mean, this is her outdoor space. In addition to kind of a roof terrace where she hangs up some clothes around here, this is the outdoor space. And as you can see, it's completely private. Next two. So uh, one of the, uh, you know, back several slides ago, I showed you this matrix where I said, you know, vegetation is sort of where it's at, but the other big var variable is depth. And so more and more, you know, I got concerned with it, it, how do you tell a designer how to proportion a courtyard? Can I, can I help at all someone understand the relationship between des the decisions that the designer makes when they give birth to the building? What difference might that make in cooling performance? And there's this thing called the aspect ratio that is in common usage when we're talking about daylight uh, penetration and daylight distribution, where you take the floor area as the numerator and the average wall height squared as the denominator. And you get uh, this thing called the aspect ratio. So just so that we're all on the same page, let me point out that a perfect cube, the courtyard in the shape of a perfect cube would have an aspect ratio of 1.0. If it's deeper than a cube, it would be less than one. If it's shallower than a cube, more than one. All right? 
And here's an example of uh, a courtyard in uh, Segovia, Spain. Uh, with, here's the floor area, and here's the average height of the walls squared around this courtyard. Okay, next slide just over here. So here's a graph then. I ended up doing detailed measurements of, a, of 43 courtyards across Spain and Mexico. Uh, and here's a graph of all 43 of them where the courtyard floor area is this way and the aspect ratio is plotted this way. And you can see that there is then this tendency, first of all, toward rather small courtyards. If you can read this, this is a 200 square foot courtyard floor, 300, 400, 500 square feet. So you can see that, that, that at least half the courtyards were 500 square feet or, or smaller in, in uh, floor area. These are not huge spaces. And you can also see that the smaller the courtyard, the lower the aspect ratio. So right about where the cube is, one, you know, at least half those courtyards were real close to that or, or, or deeper than a cube. Next slide just over here. And one of the things that, that from the very beginning that I, as I began to look at the courtyard, every time I came into one of these zaguan, zaguanes, and, go, and went on into the courtyard, I would be surprised at how much cooler it was than the street. And so really quickly I realized that the highest daily cycle between uh, high and low it happens here on the sidewalk of the street. Then the next highest range of temperature comes here in the courtyard itself. An even lower high-low cycle range would be encountered typically in the arcades. And then the least amount of difference between high and low would be the rooms behind the arcade. So a lot of my research went into looking at whether this was true and to what extent. Next slide over here, please. So, and next slide over on the left. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is to take you through three courtyards in Cordoba that are almost the same size. Uh, but the first one is quite shallow. The second one is sort of mid-depth. And the last one is the deepest of the three. And here, uh, the, I'm, I had enough of these little temperature devices that I monitored them simultaneously over the same three hot days. So here was the official court of a temperature recorded in the paper. And here's the uh, Fahrenheit on the left, centigrade on the right. So take your choice of which scale you're comfortable with. And you can see that these are pretty hot days. All right. So the shallow courtyard was doing this, whereas the deep courtyard was doing this. Now, on these plans, uh, the, the, the most shallow courtyard was, uh, oh boy, I thought I had it on this one. That's embarrassing. I don't have the plan of this one. The, the half, um, the one that's right in the middle is this courtyard, and then the deep courtyard on the bottom is this one, and you can see that it was oriented north-south. You can also see that whether the courtyard faces north or not is a complete accident. In a place like Cordoba that was not laid out on the grid, the orientation of the courtyard is almost always the same as the street in front of the house. So if the street in front of the house runs north-south, then so is your courtyard going to run north-south. All right, next two. So let's look at the most shallow courtyard first. It's right on the edge of a portion of Cordoba that was redeveloped as this. So this is more contemporary housing here. But here's this old uh, Calle Ancada wide enough for about two cars. And here is the courtyard and its surrounding building uh, on the map. And when you're standing on Calle Ancada and looking through the Zaguan, here's the view into the courtyard. Next two. So here then is, the, is a working well, as you can see. The owner here is pumping water from a little, little motorized pump that she puts down in the well uh, into a hose. And then she can fill other buckets or do anything you want with the water. But the point is that the sloppier, the better. Because in a hot, dry climate, spilled water winds up as evaporative cooling. And that's a really important cooling mechanism for courtyards in those kinds of climates. In a hot, wet climate, it's not going to do you much good. Hot, dry climate, wonderful. So be messy with the water is one of the first rules of living in a hot, dry courtyard environment. And here again, you know, here's the, the view of the well, complete with Easter lilies, and the uh, house that sometimes is only one floor high, sometimes two floor, that surrounds this courtyard. Next two. And remember, this is the courtyard, whoops, this is the courtyard back with the highest daily swing. 
So here then is the, another view of the courtyard, and here is looking up to the sky from the northern sort of corner of this courtyard. So that's essentially your contact with nature, that, that view toward the sky. And here again begins to illustrate a newer building off to the, off to the left, begins to illustrate how important it is if you're going to preserve the kind of privacy and social centrality of the courtyard in these buildings, you've got to zone in such a way that you can't come in and do things like this and have people staring down into total strangers staring down into your courtyard. It just doesn't work. Next two. Okay, so this is the, the median, you know, the, the, the one that, that sort of had a median uh, range between high and low. Much lower than the daily highs, but also somewhat higher than the daily lows in Cordoba. And here again is one of these just critically narrow street, streets, a Calle Aranias, one car wide, nothing more. And here then is the, here's the street that, that finally next down to the place where uh, even Volkswagens leave marks on the walls. And uh, this is a, a view of that, and uh, here's the house that we're going to be looking at. This courtyard is slightly on, elongated east-west. Next to you. Now, the people who live in this house work, I'm sorry, can, just for a minute, can you back up one here? They live here, and their shop is just off the map. Okay, now, uh, forward on this. So they run this shop. That's the door to their shop. And when you look through the door to their shop, there they are behind the counter. And almost everything that they sell is visible in this picture. So that's the way you live typically in these courtyard neighborhoods. You run very small shops, and you make about six or seven stops a day in order to do the shopping for groceries or, or, or whatever you're going to buy takes several stops in small shops rather than one visit to a supermarket. Next two. So when they come home uh, at noon for their siesta, uh, this is what they see. Uh, you come, th this is one of the unusual zaguanes that leads into an arcade rather than directly into the courtyard. So you sort of see the courtyard off to the left. And here then is what you actually see from the street. And then when you sort of turn around and look toward their living room, uh, this is what you see. So you can see it's a pretty small courtyard, sort of stones set in a very soft mortar that will absorb water and, and give it back. Next to it. Looking down into their courtyard, uh, this is what you find. And looking up toward the sky, that's their contact with nature. Next to it. Now the deepest courtyard is on a, uh, once again, very narrow street, uh, rather dark at the time I took this photograph. And here's, it, it runs due north-south, uh, which is fairly rare. And here's their house around this really narrow, deep, north-south elongated courtyard. Next to it. Here's a view of the courtyard. That's them, you know, uh, she isn't as angry as she looks, by the way. And uh, you, you can see that, once again, just plants everywhere in, in this otherwise fairly barren courtyard. Next to it. And also, oops. And also, uh, this had this very unusual series of casement windows that opened on the second floor. It was just, just a lovely courtyard. And what these two old elderly women do is they rent rooms out around the upstairs to men who work in Cordoba and need a room to rent. So uh, they sort of run a pension, if you will. And once again, here's the uh, contact with the sky. Next two. So, um, Whereas I would love to stand here and tell you that I have an ironclad kind of design guideline that will tell you that if you do a certain proportion, you'll have a certain number of degrees change from the hottest temperature of the day. I can't with a whole lot of confidence tell you that. I've tried it in my book. So there will, there will be a guideline in there with warnings about its usage. But, but once again, we give birth to the building. The people who live there carry it, raise it, if you, if you want to try to make a human analogy. And it's in living in these places, in thermally sailing them, that these courtyards achieve their best thermal performance, is when the people who live there make the kind of decisions that, that, that are the right decisions. And so let me just take you through a few of those. Uh, one of the things about these courtyards is that very typically the floors are highly absorbent. You might not normally think of rock as being absorbent for water, but if you set small stones in really porous mortar, 
you can put, you, you can, you know, a lot of water is going to soak into this floor, and over hours and hours and hours, it's going to be there to be able to evaporate and wick up from the ground and give you evaporative cooling on the floor of the courtyard. And of course, the more shallow the courtyard, the more important that is because it can get a lot of sun during the day if it's not a deep courtyard. So sort of thing number one is go with an absorbent floor when you can, a uh, floor absorbent to water. Next to. Here are some other examples of these wonderful sort of pebble patterns. Uh, another great thing about a courtyard, animals are so safe. I mean, imagine on a street that's one lane wide, what chance a cat or a dog has if it darts suddenly out on the street. I mean, there, you don't, there's no way to see it coming. So very often uh, you'll find these courtyards um, harboring cats, and then you'll find dogs guarding the courtyard, and their, do their job is to bark the moment they hear the doorbell. So dogs and cats and courtyards get along really well. If uh, you find a mess on the floor, it's not nearly as serious in the courtyard as it is in the living room. Next two. Um, but then uh, you'll also find where people are sort of after el an elegant, a sort of ambiance of elegance, they'll go for these white mar marble floors and just polish them to the T, you know, and it's gorgeous, but boy, it doesn't hold, it's, this is not going to hold water for more than a few minutes. So sometimes you just turn around and then you put a body of water in the courtyard, which is what they've done here, and surrounded it by this marble floor, and of course, complete with fish and all the kinds of things that you can have. So you, you create your own garden in this courtyard. Next to And so here's a couple of other examples of the way you put can put water in the middle of a courtyard. This one from uh, Colima, Mexico, actually in a new house on the outskirts. And this one again from uh, Cordoba. And here again, the, 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 beauty, the, the beauty of light sparkling on the water, the sound of the water in the fountain, all of these add to a, a psychological impression of cooling that is just really nice in this hot, arid environment. And one of the, this by the way is the, is the, the same uh, courtyard that won the patio contest that I showed you on the front page of the paper. They had just announced the winner. She already had anticipated that she would win, so she had tables and chairs in reserve for the ceremony. And in fact, a professional prof uh, photographer from the paper is scowling there in the corner because I got there first, and he, and he was, you know, waiting for me to finish photographing. So here was the winning patio, complete with, you know, ripe lemons on the trees. And when you have these plants, and it was after observing this for a while that I realized, you know, not only are these things beautiful, but they act as catalysts for watering. Next two. Because when in a hot, dry climate, when you have this many plants and pots, th this is very time consuming. And so what pe people typically do is they have these long, long poles, and you fill, laboriously, you fill the can at the, at the spigot, you put it on the pole, you lift it up, and then you, you tilt it. And again and again you do this, and, the, and once again, sloppiness pays. The more water you spill in the process of watering these plants, the more of that water runs down the walls and winds up on the floor, increasing the evaporatively cooling surface. So particularly if you do it at the right time of day, you really get a huge thermal payoff just by watering the plants. Next to but the most fascinating thing of all is the toldo, to me anyway, is the toldo. And that's where people recognize that the sun comes in by day and heat overheats the patio. But at night, one of the best sources of cooling you've got is a cold, clear sky. And you can get huge radiant losses between a warm courtyard floor and a cold, clear sky. And in a, in a hot, dry climate, typically you do have cold, clear sky. So the sky, for example, over Phoenix is a lot colder than the sky over Miami because you don't have all that water in the air. You can, you can have m much more significant radiant losses in a hot, dry climate. So here's Oaxaca, Mexico, and here's Cordoba, Spain. Uh, here the toldo is translucent blue. And if you pulled that all the way shut and didn't let any sun through, uh, then it does sort of funny things to your complexion. You kind of look pallid, maybe a little cadaverous. Uh, and, and here it's strips of white fabric, as you can see, that then let these strips of light through uh, on the floor. So it's two entirely different sort of visual um, uh, results of this attempt to protect from direct sun by day. Next two. 
Very typical Toldo in Cordoba. Very typical. Dark green, almost opaque, just slightly translucent. You can see the see the Toldo kind of glowing in the direct sun. Little grommets, so that if the rain comes unexpectedly before you can pull the Toldo back, rather than just pulling all the Toldo down into the courtyard floor, the rain will run out those grommets for at least a while. Next two. So here is a, a courtyard in Sevilla, Spain, in a hotel that we were staying in, that a converted house again in a hotel. And looking down onto the courtyard in the evening, this is what we, we saw. Looking down into the courtyard in the middle of the day, that's what we saw, right? So obviously you pull this toldo closed whenever the sun is a threat to your courtyard. And the minute the sun gets off the toldo, pull it open so that you'll get that all hours and hours and hours of radiant loss to the clear sky. Let's take a look first of all at, at in the evening when the toldo is open, what does it look like down below? Could we just see the next slide on the right? And so you'll notice that the blue around the fountain and the sort of the blue along that band is a fairly vivid blue because you're looking at an absolutely clear blue sky. The sun has gone, the sun is no longer in the picture, but it hasn't set yet. So you still have daylight and you've got that blue sky that's really making this look blue. Now, let's go forward on this one and backward on that one. Oops, backward, no, that was my fault. Uh, forward. <laughs> there. Okay. And that's what it looks like with the, tol with the sun on the toldo. And you can see there's a huge difference there. Now let's advance at one on the right. There's a huge difference there. When you're filtering the sun through this sort of off-white toldo, you're going to get this sort of yellowish cast. And you can see that the blue is just sort of sulking. You know, the blue is waiting for its chance in the evening. But during the day, this, this sort of yellowish white toldo is just destroying the effect of the blue in the courtyard. So I found thermally it fascinating, but, but it, it did things visually to the courtyard that, that I found kind of disturbing. And so I said to them, like particularly with that dark green one, I said, well, don't you kind of find it depressing? And they said, depressing? If it's dark, it's cool. It, it connotes coolness if there's a lack of daylight. Next to, which is just not the way I think of daylighting at all, being from a cold climate. So another example then of this whole sort of thermal regulation, this is one of the most expensive, uh, the, the best families of Cordoba belong to this private club. And here is the, the main courtyard of the private club. And this is what it looks like when you find it in July and August. This is look, what it looks like in February. So these elaborate, leaded glass, arched things have to live somewhere all summer long. And then they come and put them up all around the courtyard in the wintertime. Next two. And when I went back in May, what I found was that they don't take them up and put them down all at once. They sort of do it selectively. So there's this sort of transition period where some of the, part, some of the arches and some of the parts of arches have the leaded glass and others are open. And then you walk out into the courtyard and here's this elaborate toldo system that can be pulled shut by motors, whereas most of the residential toldos, they're just these wonderful series of ropes that you pull uh, to open and close it. Here it's obviously being done by motors and winches. Next two. So um, the last example I want to show you is uh, this uh, courtyard house in Borno, Spain. Here's Sevilla, and here's the Strait of Gibraltar. And Bornos is a tiny little town that sits right about there. And you, as you can see, this street is a little bit wider than the other streets we've been looking at. But we're going to look at this three-story house here on the left next to. And uh, this is the main patio of this house. And you can see that there's a translucent toldo that floats way up at about the third floor level over this thing. And here are uh, sections through two, uh, two ways. Here's the, the street, and then this block of building. And we're going to be looking at the comparative temperatures between this ground floor room, the second floor salon right above it, and a temperature uh, device up on the terrace so that when the toldo is closed, it's, it's shaded by the toldo. But when the toldo is open, it's looking right at the sky. So we're going to be looking at a comparison between those three temperatures. Next two. And uh, here's some plans of it. And Alfredo's question was, was about uh, you know, when you have an Islamic entrance, 
how that might differ from the Hispanic. And here's a, here's a graphic example. Because this house was built back when the Moors controlled southern Spain. And you entered at this corner. And you walked up a few stairs and then down a few stairs before you could enter the courtyard. So there was a lot of sort of domestic defense here. You had to walk up some stairs. There's even a balcony where you can shoot somebody or pour hot oil on them or whatever you'd need to do. I mean, you know, this was at a time when there was, there was some problems. And so that was, that's the Islamic entrance. And then here's the later Hispanic entrance that just takes you straight into the courtyard. All right, so fairly small courtyard, fairly deep courtyard. Uh, and in one corner of the courtyard is this tiny little body of water where there's a constant sort of trickling sound of water into that day and night. There's always this trickling sound of a little stream of water coming into this. And in this, these hard surfaces in a courtyard like this, it really reverberates. So there's this, this trickling water sound, this sort of a dominant element when you first come into this building. Next two. And uh, the man who owns this teaches architecture at the California College of Arts and Crafts. He's a native civilian. He spends his summers in Bornos and his winters in San Francisco. And I said, Victor, don't you have it backwards? Wouldn't you want to be in Bornos in the winter and San Francisco in the summer? And he said, San Francisco in the summer? As cold and damp and foggy as San Francisco is in the summer? No, I would much rather be in Bornos. So he spends his hot, dry summers in Bornos. And what I did was to, um, I, I met him in a previous year and said, gee, you know, Victor, this house would be a great thing to monitor. So he said, okay, send me the, ho the, the, the hobos, the monitoring devices. Tell me where to put them, where you want me to put them, and set them for about two months of performance, and I'll, I'll do it. Well, as luck would have it, five days after he put up the, the hobos in the places that I asked him to, the hottest weather of the 20th century occurred in southern Spain. So just blind luck. And what this is, he kept in a record. Uh, he called the tol toldo an awning. So he said, here's when I pulled the, the toldo closed. Here's when I pulled it open again. Here's when I watered the courtyard. Even talking about opening windows uh, once in a while. Because all, all of these are involved in the thermal sailing of one of these houses. Next two. So once again, we're going to be looking at uh, we're not looking at A, because that's the tree in the middle of the courtyard. We're looking at the ground floor room, the second floor salon right above it, and then this D up on the terrace. And from this C point, looking across the courtyard, this is what you see. So there's the sort of the burnt landscape of southern Spain in the summertime in the distance. And you can see uh, some of the things around the top of this courtyard. Next two. So how successfully then do these buildings without one shred of air conditioning, how successfully do they perform in truly hot weather? All right, here's, once again, here's the, the Fahrenheit scale, here's the centigrade scale. Here is what the toldo up on the roof was experiencing, up on the terrace, that's what it was experiencing. Here's the official high and low at a weather station that's only about six kilometers away. And so you can see that the one on the terrace tracked almost exactly what the weather station was reading. Here is the 80 degree line that where I would say most North Americans would begin to say, where's the air conditioning? Now, in, when you're in this hot a climate, 80 still feels quite cool, but we would say, oh, well, at 80 degrees, obviously, you're going to need to turn on an air conditioner. Um, that's what we have become accustomed to. And so if you really s sort of thought of 80 as the highest tolerable temperature, you can see that the second floor salon was surpassing 80 somewhat. But consider the temperature outside hours before and how much cooler these rooms seem. And here, I'm not just measuring air temperature. I'm not measuring the surface temperature of those massive walls that would lag behind the air temperature. And here, by the way, is we're up on the terrace, and the toldo was sitting right on this ledge. So you can see that when the toldo's closed, it's shaded, but when it's open, it's looking at the night sky. Uh, next slide, just over here. Uh, advance. Yeah, and so now we're just going to look, we're, we're just looking at the nighttime portion here. Because what I'm inviting you to do now is to follow along. The second floor salon is the main living room of this family. And Victor takes personal responsibility for when windows are opened and closed and all this kind of thing. And so let's just track 
what was happening in the nighttime because this other, I've talked about evaporative cooling, I've talked about radiant cooling to the cold night sky, but I haven't yet talked about night ventilation of mass, where you deliberately close the windows by day to keep the hot air out, but the moment the things start to cool off, you want to open it so that that cool air can help cool off your building. So let's track how successfully this was happening. Can you uh, focus over here? Here is the falling temperature on the terrace as nighttime comes. And you can see that it got almost, almost as cold as the official low that night. Here is the temperature in the room, and you can see very clearly when Victor opened the windows, right? Almost by magic, moments after the falling temperature outside became appropriate, he opened the window, and the temperature in the room started tracking downward along with the temperature here until finally you hit a place where the, the heat being given back by the floor, the walls, and the ceiling sort of overcomes the dropping temperature of the air that's washing through. And if Victor had only gotten up in the morning in time to close the windows here instead of there, think of where the room would have started early in the morning instead of up here. So you can really see the thermal, the consequences of smart thermal, thermal sailing. And of course in Spain, you know, you eat so late and you go to bed even later. And so getting up early in the morning for, get it. And obviously that happened two days in a row. And then I, then I saw this and I said, Victor, what happened? You know, you were so good about closing the windows here. He said, oh, we went to Sevilla for dinner and didn't get back till one o'clock in the morning. Next two. So if you, um, w one of the other things I just have to say about Victor's house, this is his rear wall garden behind the patio, and here's a lap pool that Victor installed, and here's a little grotto underneath. Next slide, just over here. And there's his toldo floating up over the patio behind. So if worse comes to worst, you jump in the lap pool, you swim into the grotto, hop out onto the edge, and now you have conductive cooling, right? Conductive to the water, so. Next two. That's pretty much it. Um, this is one of, one of my favorite uh, courtyards in Cordoba that became the cover of the book. And here, these ropes, by the way, are the ropes that you open and close the toldo with. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>